Would you like to know the secret for not receiving a citation when you get pulled over by a police officer? Stay with us and learn what that secret is. Greetings, dear friends. My name is Marvin Clark. And I'm Judy Clark. And together, we're going to look at the law of God, the Ten Commandments, and that's our program today. Everybody has to operate by law. It's just something we have to do. If somebody refuses to do that, they get in trouble. Uh, I, I imagine, Judy, if you were trying to teach your students uh, the importance of of obeying the law or having rules and uh, laws in whatever we do basically one of the ways you might do that maybe you've already tried this is to uh, have a baseball game and, and have no rules or or laws connected with it just play baseball and the outcome would be uh, pretty evident to them that they need to have some rules because a kid could run to uh, a third base after he hit the ball instead of first <laughs> he could uh, have 10 strikes instead of three and on and on it goes it would be total chaos without some rules and some regulations and some laws and life is like that for adults as well every country every city every business every organization every sporting event needs certain laws in order to function smoothly everything we do requires law if not we're going to have chaos. Well, let's start this program by looking at the purpose of God's law, His Ten Commandment law. What did He give it to us for? Uh, Romans 3.20 is good here. It says, Therefore, by the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. Now there it is. There's the clue. There's what we need to, to grab onto to find a reason or a, uh, a desire that God had in His heart, in His mind, when He gave us that Ten Commandment law. And what was it? For by the law is the knowledge of sin. God's far-reaching Ten Commandment law covers everything we could ever do or think. It is very broad. And so he says, by the law, you'll have the knowledge of sin. The law is kind of a guideline or sometimes called a mirror to show us what's right and what's wrong. And we can compare our life with that law and see how we're doing. Unfortunately, without Jesus Christ, we're all doing rather badly. So the purpose of the law, to show us what is right, what is wrong, and to get us on track to follow God's plan for our life. Now, what is not the purpose for God's law? This is where many people get tangled up, and it is so easy to fall into this trap. And that is that, that law-keeping cannot save anybody. Everybody who is saved will be a law-keeper, but law-keeping will not make you a saved person. Only Jesus can do that. A really neat verse that talks uh, to that topic is Titus 3, and we'll look at verses 3, 4, 5, and 6. Very clear. Check this out. For while we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving different lusts and pleasures, we were living in malice and envy, we were hateful and hating one another, but after that, oh, I love that part. But after that, something happened. After that, the kindness and love of God our Savior toward us appeared. And that's why Judy and I are sitting here today, because the kindness of our amazing, incredible, loving God appeared to us. And we said, I want Him. And you can do the same thing. You can receive Him today. So it's not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to His mercy, He saved us. Hang on to that one. It's not by law-keeping that we may have done, but according to His mercy that He saved us. By the washing of regeneration 
and renewing by the Holy Ghost, which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. So what is not the purpose of law keeping? To, to get saved, to save ourselves. Judy, you have one in Ephesians chapter 2, and we'll look at verse 8 and 9 that says it even more clearly. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. <laughs> and boast we would. Okay. Boast we would if we had any part of being saved. You can guarantee it. We would likely say, well, God saved me 99% worth, but I kicked in there with my 1% and we made it. No, no, no. God does it 100%. And that verse made it ever so clear. It, it is really neat when you, when you uh, see that the law of God, the Ten Commandment law of God, is a picture of God. It's a picture of God's character. But it was written in a negative way, thou shalt not, because of whom God was dealing with. He was dealing with uh, some spiritual babies who had just come out of Egypt uh, as slaves in Egypt, and they were anything but spiritual. So God had to treat them like we would treat a little two or three year old child when we would say, uh, do not cross the sidewalk, and walk into the street. You might get hurt. Do not do that. We would not, Judy, say, now you might not want to go out in the street because uh, a car could do something that you might not like. No. A two or three-year-old kid, we're going to say, don't cross that line. Don't go off that lawn. Don't go off that sidewalk. And we'll be firm about it. That's what God had to do with his kids there at the... Uh, bottom of Mount Sinai. He had to get kind of tough. So, the law is a picture of God's character. It's written in a negative way. That's okay. Just reverse that and make it a positive way. The Bible says God is just, Romans 3.26. It says God's law is just, Romans 7.12. The Bible says God is pure, 1 John 3.3. The Bible also says his law is pure, Psalm 19, 7 and 8. The Bible says God is spiritual, 1 Corinthians 10, 1 to 4. His law is spiritual, Romans 7, 14. God is holy, Isaiah 6, 3. His law is holy, Romans 7, 12. God is the truth, John 14, 6. His law is truth, Psalm 119, 42. And God is perfect. Matthew 5, 48, his law is also perfect, Psalm 19, 7. So the law, if we look at it in the right way, is a picture of God's character. It, it sums up what God is all about. When I teach it to children, I turn it around in the concept of instead of thou shalt not, thou shalt not, which they don't understand totally. Mm -hmm. It's easier to say this is what God's saying. I cannot do those things, and because I cannot do that, you'll be happy if you choose not to. And they understand happiness and how they want to be happy. And, you know, if it says, you know, thou shalt have no other gods before me, well, why does he say that? Because he wants you to know there are no other gods other than he. And so he's telling you, you'll be happy if you know that I'm the one and only true God. So you can make it abbreviated, but in a way that helps them to understand how much their God in heaven truly does love them through the Ten Commandments, they can meet him. Good stuff, Judy. Very practical, good stuff. So if, if you convince a child that he or she would be better off not stealing something, which is one of the commandments, that they would be happier by doing so, I guess they can quickly see that sometimes people who do steal things get thrown in jail, have to go to court, and that's not very happy. No, because young children understand that for every choice they make, there are consequences no matter what age we are. If we make, if we make choices that we feel comfortable with, then we're very comfortable with the consequences. There is no fear in that. If we choose to go on the other direction or in the other direction, 
and we know the consequences are not going to be so good, then we're certainly not going to be very happy people. And we dread the consequence that comes after our choice. Makes sense. Makes good sense. Thank you for sharing that. The Bible makes it really clear that God's law is the standard by which everyone will be judged. So, so that God's Ten Commandment law is, is the standard in the judgment by which everyone will be judged. Here's the way it's, it reads in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 13 and 14. The wise man said, Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep His commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. And also in James chapter 2, Judy, verses 10, 11, and 12, if you could read that one. For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. For he that said, do not commit adultery, said also, do not kill. Now if thou commit no adultery, yet if thou kill, thou art become a transgressor of the law. So speak ye, and so do, as they that shall be judged by the law of liberty. I like the, the last word there. It says we'll be judged by the law of liberty. There's some freedom in that. And I think when we read these next couple of passages, we'll get to understand what that freedom is all about. Let's, let's check it out. In Psalm 19, the psalmist says, verses 7 to 11, and notice how positive this is. It's not negative. He makes it ever so positive and beautiful. Talking about the law of the Lord. The law of the Lord is perfect. It converts the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure and it makes wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold. Are you kidding me? <laughs> More to be desired is the Ten Commandment law of God than gold? That's what he says. More to be desired are they than gold? Yes, than much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is thy servant warned. There it is. The purpose of the law to warn us when we're getting off track. And in keeping of them, there is great reward. Not just later on up there, but right now here. Great reward. Now, why could somebody say that? Why would a Bible writer write such a positive thing that the Ten Commandments are, are more important and more beautiful than gold? How could that be? Well, they knew the God. The Bible writers that spoke like that knew the God of the law, and that's what won them over. Here's the way John says it in 1 John 5, verse 2 and 3. He says, By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep His commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not grievous. They're not hard. They're not difficult. It's not drudgery to do them and keep them if, if you have love. That's the key. If you love God, you're going to keep His commandments. From the heart, you're going to. It's going to be natural. It's going to be easy because you love Him and you'll find yourself doing His will with delight. Judy, I almost hesitate to bring this up because I haven't done this for a while, but uh, back when I was a good guy and I bring, would bring you flowers home and, and uh, a little treats here and there, and I would come to the door and have a uh, kind of a, uh, a grin on my face and have my hand behind me, and in my hand was a bouquet of flowers. You'd open the door, and, and I'd have that crazy look and smile there, and you'd say, what do you have behind your, your back, Marvin? And I'd say, oh, something for somebody that uh, I love. And all of a sudden, I'd pull those flowers out and hand them to you, and you would probably plant a kiss somewhere up here, 
and uh, say thank you for doing that. Uh, why would you not, though, instead of doing that and being so gracious, why wouldn't you just kick me in the shins? <laughs> <laughs> because you knew it was genuine and it was coming from the heart. There you go. It was genuine, something I wanted to do, and it was obviously a heart response to the love that I have for you. So, same thing with God. If we love and appreciate Him for what He has done and is doing and will do for us for eternity, it's pretty hard to kick Him in the shins. We'll gladly, we'll, with a heart filled with praise and thanks, do what He would like us to do. And I think to keep the focus on the ability to observe and accept and obey the Ten Commandments, that's when we come to a humble point in our life where we know that we need Jesus more than anything. We need to be so filled with His Spirit that we plead with Him to help us not to do things that go against a God that we love so much. There you go. Makes sense. And that's what the Bible writers did. That's how they can say, I delight, I delight to do thy will, O Lord, because your law is written right here mm -hmm. in my heart. Okay, here it comes for our parents and our grandparents, Judy, that are right now asking and wondering, how can a parent or how can a grandparent teach their children the importance of observing not only the laws of the land, but also the laws of their Creator God? Again, it comes from spending time with the child. And over and over, I, I just want to stress how important it is to spend just a few moments every day with your child, with God's Word before you and before them, as you humbly seek for the blessing, the prayer of blessing over each child as they begin each day, mm. to humbly dedicate them to Jesus anew and let them hear your dedicate, dedicating prayer. Um, you want to guide them into His presence, and they need to see that it's genuine from your heart. Mm. As they see that it's that way, then throughout the day, you ask God to guide you and how to direct them to Him, whether it's from, do you know why we don't touch the stove when it's hot? Do you know why Mommy has this rule? It's because I love you so much, I don't want to see you cry from pain. And isn't it nice that God loves us so much? that He gave us these Ten Commandments so that we don't cry out in pain or cry out in sorrow because of what we have chosen to do. There are moments like that that we can um, bring them back to understanding of the Ten Commandments. And then don't be afraid to read the Ten Commandments. A lot of people get afraid because they feel like it's nothing but condemnation, and it isn't. It is definitely a window into God and His character. And when we can look at it with that in mind, we will hunger to read those, memorize them, and keep them in our heart. Mm. Right now, my students are memorizing this, and several other students in the school have, and young people that we've had connection with, are memorizing the Ten Commandments. And you can hear them throughout the day. They'll, some word will come up, and then they'll finish a sentence that came from the Ten Commandments, and they'll go, oh! I just said the Ten Commandments. <laughs> I said the fourth one, or I said the third one. Yeah. And they're young, their minds will grasp it, and then when Jesus needs them to understand it, it will be recalled, and they will have a new understanding. Beautiful. I remember it wasn't too long ago, I, I, I grabbed a, a little girl out of your fourth grade class and uh, took her to a church. And uh, during the service, I had her come up to the front and said, I understand that you've been learning the Ten Commandments in your classroom. Could you share those with us? And that little girl went down without missing a word from the first commandment to the tenth and laid them out there. And the people were sitting there with open mouths and saying, what is going on? How could that little girl have memorized the whole Ten Commandments so nicely? And that's what you're teaching them in that class. Praise the Lord. It will last with them forever. If we can just understand that a child's brain is so much like a, an open sponge that is thirsting to you know, not be dry, but just be filled with knowledge, and they can memorize so quick, so quick, that you need to continually give them that opportunity for memorization. So start them young. Start them young and 
fill them with all of God's word as much as you can. There you go. Sounds good. Talking about God writing his law in someone's heart, he really can do that. He really will do that. Listen to this. It's Hebrews chapter 8, verse 10. This is God talking. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my laws into their mind, but he doesn't stop there. Watch this. And I'll write them in their hearts. And I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. So when God talks about writing the law in our hearts, that's his way of saying, you're going to naturally do the law out of appreciation for my love for you and your love for me. It's going to come easily for you. You won't have to, to fight and, and force yourself to obey me. You'll do it because you love me. I'm going to write that law in your heart. And that's why the writer of the psalm could say in Psalm 40, verse 8, I delight to do thy will. Oh, my God, yes, your law is in my heart. There's certainly a difference between when you watch people do something because they think they have to and because they want to. And that is definitely a, an opportunity to step back and re-explain and redirect so that we understand that we want a heartfelt response, not a have to because it's the law type that, response. That makes all the difference in the world right there. And, and you just led us into our next verse, which is Romans 13, 8 to 10, where it says, love is the fulfilling of the law. Hang on to that while I read this and we'll come back to it. What does the writer of Romans mean when he says love is the fulfilling of the law? He says, Romans 13, 8, Owe no man anything but to love one another. For he that loveth another has fulfilled the law. Do you see how? If you love somebody, you're not going to go steal their wife or their husband. If you love somebody, you're not going to sneak in their, their garage when they're asleep and, and steal things out of their garage. Okay? You're just not going to do it because you have love for them. Same way with God. We have love for him. We're going to choose to obey him. For this, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet. And if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Sure, you're not going to hurt your neighbor because you love your neighbor. So love worketh no ill to his neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. That neat? We love God? He says, if you love me, keep my commandments. John 14, 15. Now, Judy, I promised at the beginning of this program to <laughs> give my secret for getting pulled over by a police officer and not receiving a citation. I've shared this in church a couple of times, and now I'm going to share it with our viewing audience. So here it goes. When you get pulled over by a policeman, everybody does the same thing, okay? Across the board. But I'm going to tell you, don't do that. And believe me, you'll have to fight not to do it because it comes naturally. The first thing you're going to do when that policeman walks up to your window and says, didn't you see that stop sign back there? You're going to say, oh, man, no, I didn't see that thing. Uh, you know, I was thinking about this, I was thinking about that, I'm in a real hurry, and I, I just wasn't thinking about the stop signs, and oh man, I'm so sorry I, I did that. Uh, I usually drive really well, but I, this time I, I just wasn't aware of that. I know I'm too tired. The excuses flow, and they flow, and they flow. And I can tell you right now, police officers get so sick and so tired of all these crazy excuses that the people give, and everybody does it. So <laughs> what blows them away, what catches them totally off guard is taking responsibility for what you did and offering no excuse whatsoever. Believe me, it's hard. It's not natural, and you'll have to fight the urge to do it. 
but I've learned how to do it. And can I say, is it okay that pastors get pulled over once in a while, Judy? <laughs> I hope so. I do get pulled over once in a while. In fact, the last one was when our daughter was here visiting us, and that was just within the last two weeks. Uh, but I, I used the technique I'm sharing with you right now, and I did not get a ticket, all right? And it's happened more times than I would care to admit, telling you how many times, but it's been several, and I've never got a ticket when I did this, all right? Don't <laughs> make up any crazy excuses. Admit what you did, say I blew it, and that's it. It will so surprise the officer, and so shock the officer, and so please the officer that you have a fairly good chance, actually a pretty good chance, of maybe getting a warning and not a citation. There it is. Try it. See if it works for you. We've also seen that it does help when you thank them for the great job they're doing and making your community feel safer, too. They're not expecting gratitude. That's right. Right. And, and you've done that. You brought uh, police officers in to your school, and the children made them cookies and, and drew them really neat pictures, telling them how much they appreciate what they're doing. And that, that, that's a good way to approach it as well. We'll look at one more verse, and that is the one that says, uh, it's um, Matthew 5, 17. Think not that I have come, Jesus says, to destroy the law or the prophets. I'm not come to destroy them, but to fulfill them. He fulfilled the law by living the law out. He lived the law out in his life. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass away, not one jot or one tittle shall in, in no way pass from the law, until all be fulfilled. So Jesus is saying in this passage, the law will last as long as God lasts. It will never come to an end. Even in heaven, the law will be our uh, code of conduct. It won't be written down probably because it'll be in our hearts. But the law was active in the Garden of Eden, even though it wasn't written down yet. The law is active now. And even throughout eternity, the law is alive and well. So don't throw away the law. It's in the Bible.